Those guys will set your hair on fire. I love the Del Sol. DelSolQuartet.com, they've got a great legacy of bringing art into new spaces to new audiences. They do the full gamut of music making from traditional concerts to um, out in clubs playing over beats. They're a wonderful group. The opening example about how to deal with change on a logistical level is also emblematic of some of the things that we have to deal with when confronting institutions or audience expectations and whatnot. So that little volume knob on that sax player's wireless mic can be a little analogy for other kinds of challenges we face. I'd like to talk about two different approaches to presenting new art in new ways. One from left field and another from within an institution. What the Bagatelles are all about is presenting a string quartet in new spaces. When you go into new space and you have a string quartet, we have this culture clash because obviously the quartet is this perfect acoustic creation. It doesn't really get any better. Yet a lot of times if you're playing in say the mezzanine club, in downtown San Francisco, uh, or even in, in a ballroom in a hotel, you're confronting acoustic challenges. So you obviously need support to, to do some of these initiatives because the classical concert hall, while 
wonderful. It's my normal mode of operation to be within the acoustics of like architecturally incredible spaces. A lot of times to do the things that we all want to do in new ways, you have to reach out. So luckily here we have great sound, we have a great team. Mercury Soul is a project that started out here in San Francisco. And in fact, one of the reasons, that, probably the reason that I'm speaking to you all is because of Diane San Sanchez from the East Bay Community Foundation who supported Mercury Soul when it was happening in Oakland and San Francisco. What it is, is basically um, a hybrid kind of musical event. It's like a SWAT team of classical musicians visits a large party with DJs. And the, the challenge there for me, number one, is doing something that's meaningful. Because certainly you can imagine programming, some very audience friendly stuff that might work in a loud environment where people are having daiquiris blended up at the same time people are playing. But if you want to really bring this great music to people, it, you, know, you have to kind of press the envelope. So Mercury Soul began as a collaboration between Benjamin Schwartz, who used to be with the San Francisco Symphony, and Ann Patterson, a set designer and, and director who helps us on the visual end of these things. We started with a, a grant from the Cradle of Capital Foundation, and a little bit later, when I discuss some of the, the interactions with foundations, I, I might mention a few anecdotes about um, how it's been working with various groups. Mercury Soul is a, a little case study because it's something that on paper we all uh, would like to do, but it presents many challenges. When we've done it in commercial clubs here, or in say a warehouse in Chicago with Chicago Symphony musicians, or on a large scale um, with the New World Symphony and their space, we have things um, on logistical level though challenging, which we've you know kind of hit on. Obviously, sound is one of them, but also things like audience engagement and expectation. People are used to coming and sitting, uh, kind of like y'all are doing. Uh, experiencing classical music, and in fact, that's the best way to experience it. It's not something you, you can really do when you're doing a whole lot of other things. It takes very kind of focused listening. If you're going to have people blow in and out um, as if they're kind of like in some kind of title <laughs> organization with people showing up late, people leaving early, people you know coming and going and having drinks at the bar, we need to move from, say, a DJ spinning um, what some people call background music. I mean, it is background music to a certain degree, but it's very much part of the psyche of the party, the event. We need to move from that to having people appreciate something like the Del Sol Quartet. And to have a thousand people do that is challenging. So what Mercury Soul has worked on doing is this kind of crowd management psychology through substantive and also kind of cosmetic ends. On a substantive level, we try to go from the electronic world of DJing to the mainly acoustic world of classical music by mixing them. And so as a composer, I take it basically upon myself to create ways that the ensemble can start to kind of float in over this electronic music before you even really notice them. So they're just kind of like drifting in as you're kind of talking to somebody at the bar. And then Anne in the, the lighting booth um, starts to glow the stage and everything starts to kind of change over like four or five minutes and illuminations, uh, I mean projections of information start to kind of tell you what's going on. So that hopefully by the end of that five minute mercury moment we reach a point of focus. Now in order to do that in clubs, you know, we, we often uh, we're dealing with the mob and so that was a special kind of challenge because you know dealing with people who um, are interested in money and alcohol and they have different priorities than an outreach classical music group. On the other end of the spectrum, dealing with say the Chicago Symphony um, or the San Francisco Symphony where I've done a lot of work, we did an after hours party um, in Davies Hall and you're dealing with on the one hand a great body of folks who can help you with those basic logistical things, but you also of course have some institutional issues that you got to deal with because some, some people don't understand what it means to have an event like this even if they want it, even if they want it there. So when Mercury Soul has partnered with 
um, say New World Symphony or Chicago or San Francisco, there tends to be a lot of work not only with the artistic side of the equation, but also with, say, marketing. Um, in, in preparing audiences for what they're going to hear. For example, if the marketing is saying that you're going to have a club experience and you're going to be spinning on your head and you're going to kiss the face of God. People aren't going to get that full club experience no matter how good the event is because it's not a club. So we try to work with various members of the institution to help shape the expectation of not only the audience but the institution itself. Now, let's take something that, you know, Mercury Soul is a, is a, is a special project. Let's take something that is, is more of like within an institutional framework. The Chicago Symphony, where I'm composer in residence, has a wonderful new music series called Music Now. And it's been going for like 30 years. It's in this incredible space right next to Symphony Center called the Harris Theater. It's kind of like the, it's like an inverted photograph of the Met Opera. I mean, it's this 3,000 seat hall with it's all black and modern, and it's incredible. And one of the goals in curating that has been to create an immersive experience that imparts the same kind of information and the same kind of um, great music that you would encounter on a traditional concert, but to use a little bit more of the bells and whistles of stagecraft to help that happen. So that saxophone player, he's going to keep popping up. Instead of just having the house half lit and have people, you know, have him kind of walk out and take a bow and play, we thought it'd be really fascinating to have him be kind of a member of the audience. That house is totally dark. There's a spotlight following him. The projected program notes that basically, you know, technology killed the program book. We love information. We love to have program notes get to people. Um, but, you know, sometimes with, with the new audience, it's a little intimidating to have like a 45-page book um, that you can't really see anyway. And I, I, I have great respect for program annotators, but uh, they, they can, can move into this new century with projections. However, you know, working within the institutions to do this can be complicated because there are certain, you know, sometimes grant requirements to have things listed a certain way. And so, I, <laughs> and we, we, we definitely understand that sometimes people get left out of these things. So we, we have to do something that you would think would be reasonably simple, a huge team of people working to create digital program notes. And to, to do that, you know, it takes obviously the program annotator, it takes a visual designer, it takes members of various parts of the institution to make sure that everything gets represented in the right way. So what, the, what I've taken away, and I'm still learning uh, from the experience of trying to work within an institution, is that there are a lot of opportunities to do the kinds of things that we all want to do to bring new art to new people in new ways. But we often have to spend a lot of energy understanding the institution itself, and that's just natural. However, one of the things that I think has been particularly empowering in, say, Chicago is that there's a clear mandate to do something. And when you have a, a very large institution like that, you really need to have the clarity of, say, this is your series, go and do it. Because when it becomes a little bit how things might work out, then often the message gets muddled. So, so one thing that I have really appreciated when dealing not only with an institution, but also um, coming from left field in a project like Mercury Soul, is having to sit down and create real workflow kinds of organizational charts to, to figure out who is doing what. And that is something that really came up out of um, the first uh, grant Creative Capital Foundation. I felt like they were spending a lot of time on a lot of logistical angles that we just, as artists, just wanted to do our thing. Those, those little exercises they had us do in terms of managing, okay, how is this, who's going to get the information to, say, um, this particular department in your group, they were very valuable. And I think, of course, the challenge from the artistic 
and is how to have that kind of guidance um, while also having a free hand. It, so if, if taking those two case studies and trying to figure out how that impacts the relationship between the grant makers and the funders and the artists themselves, I, I found that one of the things that that as an artist I, I didn't know what to do with but eventually found to be very, very helpful was um, some, some kind of help on the professional services end. This sounds really basic, but when you receive a grant, uh, a lot of times um, people like me don't have left brains and I cannot, I cannot process how we are, I mean, I, I have a clear idea of what we're going to do and I have a pretty good organizational level um, before you get to numbers. But things like um, how you handle your, your funds and manage that with potential tax ramifications and whatnot, that's tough. And so one thing that I found that has been helpful in some um, grant, uh, with working with some foundations, is they sometimes will provide somebody who's pro bono on the legal end or on the tax end. I realize it's a little complicated because maybe there are liability reasons or something you can't get too wrapped up in planning people's taxes. <laughs> But there, there are definitely benefits for the artist, and that has really, really made the funds be best spent in some ways. With that, on the other hand, is, is the element of trust and letting the artist do what they need to do. And of course, everybody here in supporting the arts obviously wants to, to let artists do their thing. And so it's, it's, that, it's that balance between a streamlined process that makes sense and providing enough support that has, when that balance is struck, it's, it's particularly gratifying. The other thing is, you know, sometimes the folks who are interested in, in funding a project have the, have the best of intentions. They obviously are interested because they like what we're doing or whomever they're funding is doing. But it's a little bit confusing, you know, because sometimes, say, in, in, in our world of classical music, a lot of activities have happened traditionally in the schools. And that's needed really more than ever now uh, based on the situation that we're all facing. But, you know, as, as artists, we also like to think about new ways to reach out. And so sometimes talking about, say, Mercury Soul to a foundation has been challenging because we can't always conjure it up in like five words or less. It's, it's a hybrid musical event that has, you know, people coming in and out, they're not sitting down, and, and it, takes, it takes a little bit of a learning curve on the part of the funders to understand what it is. What has been wonderful for us has been when a funder knows what it is because they, they go out and check things out. And so when Diane came and saw Mercury Soul at the 111 Minute Gallery, um, it, it meant the world to us. I know it's not always possible because everybody's in different locations, but certainly the grant applications that one puts together are, you know, the work of tons of hours trying to explain what you're doing. But, um, you know, the more that artists can interact with the, the, the possible funders in their spaces, it's so, it's so great because we all have an instant understanding of what is going on. So one thing that I'd like to say in closing, because I know we don't have a, have a ton of time, is that there, there tends to be an issue sometimes. Um, classical music has a, has a bit of an image um, of, of being old school. And uh, there, I, I found that sometimes we are working against forces that we don't understand. And one of the things that I've started to understand is that there can be a fear that new activities will spook the, the diehard, loyal subscribers, the followers, that kind of thing. And, um, and that sometimes when you're trying to do something that you feel is innovative, say, you know, turning the lobby of Davies into something like a club, you, you're, you're encountering issues that you might not understand. And luckily, with the San Francisco Symphony, they are um, pretty patched into the 21st century, and that was not an issue at all. But I, I, I have found that sometimes you, you're dealing with um, a, a bit of a, a tentativeness 
not always at the top of these institutions, but sometimes uh, um, in the actual, you know, on the committee level when things happen. And so one thing that has been unbelievably helpful for Mercury Soul in the various places we go is, is trying to work not only um, with our funders and the institution heads who love the idea, but the people that are going to get passed off a lot of the work <laughs> need to understand that. They need to understand that the, the artists that are coming in have um, a vision for how something is done. And, and that takes a little bit of, of finagling because you've got a kind of a triangular structure of you know, artists, potentially funders, and the institution itself. But the more that I felt like the, the, the funders help to put the organization on a, a very clear footing, a uh, very clear path with the artist, the, the more efficient you can be in the, in the, and the more that you can do. And it allows one to take bigger risks while also balancing the fact that, you know, you're, you're coming in and working with a new group that might um, have a certain history and they want to respect that. So, you know, I, I think engagement with not only the artists themselves, but um, the places they're going and the institutions that they're having to deal with uh, is, is really important, especially when we're working with things um, that involve wireless microphones and, uh, you know, lighting and logistics. Those, a lot of things happen on those those kind of um, logistics levels. And the more support beyond the financial, the actual kind of organizational support really helps. So if y'all want to check out a little bit any, any more of what y'all have heard, I, I really do hope you, you look into Del Sol as, as a wonderful example of a way to, to bring great art into new spaces, the Del Sol Quartet.com. MercurySoul.org is um, basically, I guess we're in our third, fourth year, and we're going back to the Chicago Symphony, back to New World Symphony this year. And, um, you know, we're absolutely appreciative of everybody's efforts in the field at large and, and making new art happen in, in new ways and, and getting that information to people. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tomer, and thank you, everybody, for giving us an ear.